Welcome to Speakernomics, the official podcast of the National Speakers Association, brought to you by Leadership Books. I'm Kenneth Kinney, but friends call me Shark. And like you, I'm a professional speaker, and I love listening to Speakernomics. Speakernomics is the professional speaker show that will help you thrive and grow a speaking business so you too can change the world, one keynote session workshop and speech at a time. And on today's episode, we're going to speak with Marcus Sheridan. Marcus is a globally recognized communication expert, best-selling author of one book that has sold over 100,000 copies, a keynote speaker and CSP, and an entrepreneurial success story that started when he founded a business that grew into the world's most traffic swimming pool company. Marcus, I hope that you're ready to swim in the deep end today. Welcome to Speakernomics. How are you? Yeah, Shark, let's do this, man. It's going to be a good time. No sharks in the pool, at least. So now all to my speaking friends, how do you communicate your story, your message, your brand, and the price that comes with it as a speaker? For many, they convey it in a way that doesn't always lean into their story. But for savvy buyers, are you conveying your marketing strategy in this digital age with the answers of people considering you correctly for a keynote or speech of any kind? When they ask, will you truly be ready to answer? And before we jump in, make sure to go to speakernomics.com. That's where you can find the tips, insights, and knowledge to help you become a better speaker, build a better business, and get paid to speak. Marcus, let's dive in. Number one, how did you lean into your business story with the pool company to help you grow your speaking career? Because you're still running the company now. Yeah, yeah. So I'm still an owner of uh, River Pools in Virginia, and it's been obviously an amazing, amazing ride. I think, you know, one of the biggest issues that audiences have with speakers is it's very easy for them to to look at the speaker and say, he or she is not like me. They don't understand me. They don't understand my pain. They don't understand my suffering. They've not been in my shoes before. And uh, as a business owner, having done that and having gone through uh, the falls and the rise, of course, uh, of what we did with river pools. It's amazing, right? Because immediately, if you take pools, like in my case, it's a business anybody can put their arms around. It's a story anybody can put their arms around. It's so utterly simple. It's like, okay, so guy starts a swimming pool company with two friends, almost loses the business in 2008 because of the crash, becomes obsessive about answering his customer questions through text and video on his website, creates the most traffic swimming pool website in the world, and now he speaks all over the world sharing the story. Like, it's so easy. That's so obvious, right? And so audiences can see this, and they're just like, wow, if he could do that with a swimming pool company, why would I not do it? And what's interesting too, Shark, and I've seen this with speakers and thought leaders over the years, is sometimes – they get annoyed with telling their own story, which I, th- I think is a very big mistake. In other words, like, they get tired of it. Like it's beneath them or something like that. And so like, you know, I've done a whole lot of podcasts. Folks will come to me and they'll say, Marcus, I'm so almost embarrassed to ask you this, but do you think you might tell the, the pool guy story to our audience? I'm like, why would I be embarrassed about telling the story that has utterly changed my life? And given me the most extraordinary journey that anybody could ever ask to go on. So I never hesitate to tell the story, but ultimately, anybody can put their arms around it. And it's very endearing because they say, he's not so smart. And if he can do it, so can I. And I want my audience to be the hero and not me. And if I can get them to see themselves through my story, then I've won. Fantastic. So let's talk a little bit about transparency of pricing, because I think this is so well done on your website. You talk about this in a lot of your keynotes, as well as how we communicate it. But so few people, and we're only talking pineapples and mangoes, of course, Mm -hmm. because it's NSA. Talk about how you convey the transparency of pricing and what you see in with other speakers, as well as what you've done in your own business. Right. So, you know, I've taught businesses all over the world how to discuss cost and price on their website, right? And and the reality is everybody wants to get a feel for what are you going to charge? It doesn't matter what you are, B2B, B2C, service product, speaker. I mean, it really it really doesn't matter. And what we know also is that you know, in the speaker space, sure there's You know, you've got the bureaus of the world and they might act a little bit differently, but then you've got a lot of folks that haven't put on an event before. They don't really know 
what to do. They don't know what to expect. You know, some some are thinking five thousand. That's got to be the max that you'd ever pay a speaker, right? I mean, and and then there's folks that five thousand pineapples, right? I mean, it's just like right. It's it's like it, so it's like all these these like these question marks that people have, and so whenever I've talked to businesses about discussing cost and price. Uh, the, the, the first thing we try to explain to them is like, listen, the goal is that you teach the industry. You don't have to give extremely fine detail about what you charge per se, but they need to walk away from that video, from that article, whatever that thing is. And they need to say, oh, okay, so that's how it works in the industry. Here's what I can expect to find. Here's the different tiers of pricing if you will. So like, like if you look at the professional speaking space, it's like you've got like five tiers in which people fall in in terms of how they charge with like the bottom tier, the lowest tier being free, right? And then the upper tier being the ultra celebrities. And then you have everything in between, right? So you've got like five or six tiers. Could you explain those tiers to your audience? Well, of course you can. Could you explain what tier you generally fall in? Well, of course you can. You can do that. And see, any company can do this, right? And you know, the story in they ask you answer with my swimming pool company is is you know, that the one we were the first company in the world that talked about how much does a fiberglass pool cost. The first one in the world. Nobody was willing to talk about it. And that one single article saved my business. It generated over $35 million in sales. One single article. It took me 45 minutes to write, 35 million in sales. And um, it utterly, I mean, it utterly changed my life. And people say all the time, well, I can't talk about that because every job is different. Well, can you, can you explain the factors that make jobs different? Could you explain what drives cost up, what drives cost down? And then sometimes you hear people say, well, I don't want my competitors to see it. It's like, well, if I asked you, do you have a good sense as, as to what your competitors charge? You'd say, of course I do. And so therefore they've got a good sense as to what you charge too. It's like, there's not, there's really no big secrets here. I mean, everybody has a decent sense. That's what everybody else is charging. And the other one that a lot of folks say is, I don't want to scare them away. I don't want to scare them away. The thing that actually scares people away online, and this is for you, me, everybody, Shark, like when we're researching a product to service, a company, somebody we want to hire, whatever, it's when we can't find any information. Ignorance is what scares us away. And so when somebody takes the time to educate us and say, here's what you can expect. Here's roughly where I fall, right? Then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, wow. Okay, I get it. Now I understand. And you'll end up attracting more people because of it. So many people who are so scared that if you convey a price, and especially up and coming speakers, I've seen it over and over that they'll ask me, should I put my price out there? They're worried that somebody's going to turn them down. And it comes from a place where you get to, especially the more transparent you are with it, the more confident in your pricing. You know, I, I got to talk about price, a, a story just really quick on this, because uh, I think it's it really matters. I was one time with, uh, I was one time with Phil Jones uh, at an event, and uh, we were speaking there together. Did he know he exactly said, what to say? He did. <laughs> um, and he says to me in his perfect accent and his beautiful blue eyes, which is, that's the only reason we know he gets all the gigs and book sales. It's not because of his content, of course. Um, he says to me, Marcus, what are you charging these days? And I, and I hummed and hauled and I looked down a little bit and I gave him a, a general range and, uh, and, and no, I didn't, I, I, no, I, I gave him a number. So I said, hey, you know, I'm roughly like 15,000 mangoes. And this was probably like, I don't know, six years ago, five years ago. But I did it in such a like, almost like in a shy, embarrassed way. Mm -hmm. And he looks at me square in the eyes, right? And he says, Marcus, when you're able to say exactly what you charge and not flinch and not hesitate, you're going to start to get it every single time. And it was just like this. So I was, I was so great for me because he instilled in me this desire to believe in my pricing. I was still thinking like a pool guy, right? And I needed to I needed to just graduate from that from that mindset. And so it was one of the most powerful things any speaker's ever said to me, but he jolted me. Right. And so now of course when I say it six years later, price, it's with a smile. It's it's this like, isn't that great that they just told you that? Isn't that wonderful? And it's a different vibe, and I put off a different energy because of it with the uh, with the client. 
yeah, I having just recently put on my own event and looking at now as the person paying some of the speakers, it was totally eye-opening to me thinking about my own price in pineapples and mangoes and how that was conveyed when I would ask other people. And and I still see some very seasoned and exceptional people who him and haw, as you said. So then especially because you speak a lot in marketing and sales and on, on digital realms, how do you go about selling and marketing yourself today? And how has that changed over the last few years? Yeah. Well, no, I think, um, I think there's a few different things that, that, uh, that I'm doing that I haven't always done well. I think one of my strength areas is as soon as I'm done, uh, with the keynote and the event organizer is giddy and they're expressing that to me after the event, I always will say something like, and to think, that's only part one. And of course, that naturally is going to lend itself to them saying, what, you mean there's a part two? And I'm like, yeah. And roughly 50% of my clients each year want to do part two after they've had part one because what they're looking for is long-term behavioral transformation with their audience. Are you looking for that long-term change with your audience? And so that's, I think a lot of event organizers now are looking to actually create change, transformation, right? And not just education, not just entertainment. We want to transform behaviors. And so by making someone realize, hey, this is very common now. You don't have to bring somebody back like new every year. And that's why consistently for me, every year, 40 to 50% of the gigs that I give are be backs from the previous from you know from previous events. And so I do that well. The other thing is um I use LinkedIn very well. Um and if if you're watching this like you should probably go to my LinkedIn because it is like, like not every post is a, is a hit, but like just generally speaking, I've done well on that platform, right? And I'll probably post four times a week on average is, is what I do. But here's the thing. What LinkedIn is really for, it's not as much of a find tool for speakers, but it is a tremendous let them know of that new thing you're talking about tool. Right. And that's the really, that's really the way you should see it. Right. So I consistently have people that I have spoken to in the past, which, by the way, I'm very obsessive about connecting with everybody on LinkedIn. I do it very quick. Like the second that I get a lead, there's a connection and then I make sure to message and, and I'm going to make sure to nurture that to, in some way, shape, or form. Right. But what I have definitively found with LinkedIn multiple times, somebody reaches out and says, Hey, Marcus. And this was somebody I'd already spoken to. I I I saw that you posted on this subject. Is is that something that you're speaking on now? Can we have a conversation about that, right? Or Marcus, could you speak on that thing that you posted today at my event? And so that is how I use LinkedIn. I'm not worried about finding. I'm worried about can I make my existing previous database aware of that new thing that new value set that I could bring to their group, their audience. Yes. Fantastic. So Marcus, I want to ask you a question from a previous guest that was asked by Brittany Hudak. She said, what does the world lose if you're not on stage sharing your message? Basically, what would the world lose without you as the messenger for this thing that matters so deeply? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody said to me, Marcus, what's your what's your speaking superpower? Which, by the way, I think it's really important that we recognize what that is as speakers. I think sometimes society just tries to tell us don't don't take pride in yourself and be humble and all these things. Like, yeah, and recognize your gifts and genius when you have them. Right? It's it's like you don't want to bury that talent; you want to multiply it. And so, I think with the the great gift that I have is I simplify things in such a way that anyone can understand it. And that's always been my gift. When I was really young, Shark, one time I remember, it's like I was in like fourth grade maybe, maybe it was fifth, and I was watching 
uh, my friend next to me, his name was Mac. He was sitting next to me in class and the teacher was explaining to him a uh, math principle, you know, some uh, like something about multiplication or something like that. And I could tell Mac couldn't understand what was happening, but the teacher kept going like he could understand. And I was just like, why are you continuing to teach in a way? Can you not see that he doesn't get it? But they just couldn't simplify it enough. And they weren't so interested and obsessed with their audience that they, they couldn't read. The teacher couldn't read back in that moment. And I was really bothered by that. And I've always been bothered by audiences that has the that have that glazed look of confusion. I'm obsessed with that as a speaker. I I am dying for that light bulb. Aha. Like, ah, I get it now. One of the best compliments I ever heard was somebody came to me one time. I said, you know, Marcus, uh, I heard I, I, I heard a talk on this thing called content marketing a month ago. And it didn't make sense to me. But today you talked about it. You said that phrase, they ask, you answer. And suddenly everything made sense. And now I get it. And it's like that to me is a beautiful thing. Communion, right? That's the essence. Communication, communion, same thing. We have this thing in common. We both understand the thing. And so that to me, I think, is 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 my gift. And that's what the world might be missing if I'm not around. Fair enough. All right. What is a question that you would like to ask a future guest on this show? I would say, uh, and I'm sure this has been asked before, is what was your most deflating moment on stage? That's a great question. Yeah, because I've had I've had a couple. I've had a couple. So I love to hear other people's. Absolutely. Well, let's do a quick recap based on Marcus's super advice. Number one, when you convey your story, make it easy and obvious for them to lean into that story so they can lean into their own. It's a story that likely changed your life and may also help them change theirs. Make sure to make your audience the hero. Number two, do you explain your price digitally? And could you explain why you charge more mangoes than another speaker? Think about this. What scares people when they can't find any information? Number three, a lot of event organizers are not just looking for entertainment or information, but to create long-term behaviors. And consider using LinkedIn for a place to let your new expertise shine. Are you making sure that your database is aware of what you're speaking about now with the thoughts that you want to share? Marcus, any closing thoughts before we get out of the pool, get rid of the floaties and the pool noodles? You know, I, I one closing thought that I love for us, you know, in the in the in the communication business, and I really mean this is it's dumb not to dumb it down. And that is not a negative phrase. There's so much power when you simplify. If you can simplify, you are going to build traction, you're going to build an audience and you're going to build a career. So remember, it's dumb not to dumb it down. Fantastic. Well, friends, make sure to join us at speakernomics.com and let your voice be heard. Thank you to Leadership Books for sponsoring this episode. I'm Kenneth Shark Kenny, your host of the National Speakers Association's podcast. And this has been another fantastic episode of the show. To everyone listening at home, thank you for the privilege of your time. And remember, Speakernomics is a podcast where you'll learn to speak, get paid, repeat. <laughs>